Welcome to our monthly program center stage featuring impactful cooperative extension led programs at the local, regional and national levels. I'm Kelsey Buckler, the impact collaborative assistant with the Extension Foundation. And today you have an opportunity to learn about the North Star legacy communities and how they've developed sustainable economies and resilient communities. So I'm pleased to introduce today's program team leader, Sandra Harris Thompson from Florida A&M University. I'll go ahead and post her bio in the chat. Take it away, Sandra. Hello, I am so delighted to be here. Um, I appreciate just this opportunity to share um, what we're doing at Florida A&M um, in the North Florida Panhandle. So I'm gonna just jump right in and I'd like to introduce Ms. Pepitas, who, and please correct me if I just slaughtered your name, who is going to provide quite a bit of a theoretical um, background information um, throughout the presentation. And I so much uh, appreciate um, the hard work um, that she's done over the years that really provides a great foundation uh, for the work that we're doing here in North Florida. So I'm going to go on and share my screen. I think I can share my screen. Thank you, Sandra. I'm so pleased to be able to support your work. And uh, as Sandra said, I'm Maria. I work with the University of Delaware Cooperative Extension. And um, I'm really glad to be here. And she knows. So I'm so glad she's here. <laughs> OK, wonderful. So as you can see, this is July center stage, North Star Lakes Communities Building Sustainability Using Community Resilience, Resiliency Tenants. And I've already been introduced. I hope you love this background. It was supposed to kind of depict uh, the legacy communities because they're all different shapes and sizes. Um, just to kind of give a little bit of uh, interest. So what this is about is demonstrating how community resiliency worked to build a program birthed out of a vision where, peer, where resources appear to be absent. Um, no, not, not only resources, but just a theoretical framework. If I looked at it from uh, my position as an extension program leader and specialist, and um, this is why it's significant, because in the real world, separate from our jobs, we are all part of communities, all part of communities. And as a result of being part of community, we know that in most cases, we already have identified the problem, the need, but lack capacity to address. And so in considering this uh, North Star Legacy Communities Initiative, I knew what, how to, I knew what the problem was, I knew what we could do, but I really didn't see capacity. I didn't see how. So, um, 2018 is here, but this is what the vision uh, materialized into from 2004. And 2004 is when I moved back to Tallahassee, Florida, Leon County, which is the capital county, after having been away for 14 years. I lived in Boston for seven years and Houston for seven years. But once returning, I noticed that my community, burial community, had deteriorated in land. We were surrounded by um, urban sprawl. Um, there were no longer the mom and pop type stores. Um, it just almost seemed like it was unrecognizable until I turned on our little dirt road. And 
just working it and realizing, well, what happened? How do we address this? And at that time in 2004, my grandmother was still living. She was probably um, 93 or so. And her good friend was probably about mm, 90. And so there were people around who I who were still attached to parents who had been born in the 1800s. And so thinking about then, this was not a reality, not even this concept wasn't even there. But in my mind, and those I talked with, we knew it was what we wanted. We knew what it should be. And so over time, as the program developed, and it actually getting to this point in 2022, and meeting Maria through the Extension Foundation and looking at the work um, that uh, she and others had did on farm and farm family risk resiliency, I really realized that the work that I was doing could fit into that model. And so at this time, I like for Maria just to talk about um, where this theoretical framework um, came from. And um, hopefully you can see as I talk further after she finishes how what I'm doing is a, uh, we're doing here in North Florida is a perfect fit. Take it away, Maria. Well, thank you. So hopefully this isn't a new model for you. This model, uh, the socioecological model has been around for quite a number of years, really started um, in the 70s with uh, a gentleman named Rothenbrenner who really was focusing on how uh, we need to be thinking about the interrelationships between um, what Bonnie Braun and I have called levels, right? So you see these concentric circles and you see kind of in the center is the individual and then there's that interpersonal circle in yellow. Um, and then uh, in the work that uh, Bonnie Braun and I have done around farm and farm stress and farm resilience, we, we kind of added that, um, that green section that focuses on farms and farm families and and uh, entrepreneurs, you know, kind of home-based businesses. And then next is that purple, which is the community. Uh, and then you see sort of going outwards um, towards um, um, the, the sort of, sorry, organizations and policy environments. And so what we, what we know, right, is that each of these is influenced by um, the, uh, the other, right? So individuals can impact uh, what's happening in their interpersonal circles, in their organizational circles, in the policy environments in which they work um, or live and vice versa, right? The policies in which and the, and the regulations that are in place within a community, for example, are gonna trickle down and impact the community, impact the organizations and, um, and ultimately the individuals uh, in their community. And so um, it's a great tool to really show the interconnectedness and um, the way each of these different levels really can influence e each other. And so it helps to contextualize the complexity of um, really all of the levels uh, as you kind of depending on which level you're kind of focusing on, whether it be the individual family, the business, the community, et cetera. So um, Bonnie and I use this as a tool to really um, showcase the, the complexity um, of, of stressors, right? We were looking at farms and farm families and we were using this model as a way to kind of articulate the stressors that farms and farm families face as they do their work, uh, as they do their work. Um, and so it is a model that has been used in many other contexts. And so I'm so pleased that uh, Sandra has have embraced this and can use it as a foundation for 
community resilience. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. And um, following um, from what Maria shared, focusing on community as the level. So as we're looking at North Floor legacy communities, looking at the different areas that impact them, um, history may not normally be what you think about, um, but the context of history here is that these are these communities were on plantations when we had a slave-based system. And the descendants live in those communities now that are no longer plantations, but that's the history that comes from that. But also in that history came resilience, innovation, social interactions, ways of generating money, ways of raising children, all of those things. Also, there's land. So after emancipation, and there were some freedmen who had land prior to emancipation, but the majority came not through the Freedmen's Bureaus Act, but as um, Blacks began to acquire land a little bit after a little bit after a little bit. Until 18, oh, 1910, they had amassed 15 million acres of land. Um, basically by themselves. And now we are in 2022, almost, um, there's only about two to three million acres left. So there's been a big loss of land. And there's been a big loss of history. So those are key opportunities, but they're also key stressors. Then we have the local organizations. And that's one of the things that in conceptualizing this work, I realized that it wasn't something that one person could do. So I began to reach out um, across the Panhandle. Panhandle is that arm of North Florida going west and identified nonprofits who were invested in doing community work. Didn't matter if it was in food, uh, if it was in housing, but they were invested in um, community work that impacted um, Black people and other BIPOC communities. And they became a part of the initiative. And then the interpersonal, as was explained in the previous side, and then the individual. But then a key piece, too, was federal, state, and local government, which plays a real strategic role in policy and funds that flow. And what I saw is that all of the, the residential communities surrounding um, my legacy community, Barrow Hill, and all the others in Leon County did not have the same visible aesthetics as the big residential developments. And that really bothered me. It bothered me because I happened to be connected to history. I happened to be connected to land. But as gen each generation goes along, fewer and fewer people are. And so just looking at how all of these intersect with the legacy communities. And so also, um, particularly from Maria um, and what she shared in the model, capital assets was such a, a, a key reminder to me of utility and helping um, these communities help themselves. And so you can look at all of these and realize that, you know, there are assets in them, but a critical asset that I saw be they were stressors, but they're also assets. When I think about African-American people in the U.S., there are two things that can't be taken away. That's their history and their land. 
However, they have not learned how to transform, how to package that history and that land in ways that provide economic sustainability. And I then represented the land grant system. So I'm an asset. Even though I'm a part of the community, I'm an asset because I brought everything that I'd learned and continue to learn to this work as we had reached 2018. And so I started in land grant when I returned home in 2004. So everything that I had learned brought me to this point of realizing the vision. And then the other thing that from land grant and particularly in community resource development, community resource development in the way that it is organized and what it does, it's like a smorgasbord. Our role is to bring whatever that is out there in the landscape to help communities meet the needs and leverage their existing assets. And then of course, I also see CRD from an entrepreneurial lens in that communities have to have a way of sustaining themselves, not just existing, but sustaining in a vital way where the children, the elders, the parents have a way of living a life that is healthy, safe, and peaceful. And so then here, I'm going to um, ask Maria to again explain the overall model. And then what I'll do is come back in and talk about how we used um, their model to explain what we've been doing with the North Star Legacy Communities. So uh, again, this is, um, you know, kind of a, a, I'll just say a zoom in, I'll just say of the, of that socio-ecological model. Uh, but what, um, the way it's sort of been transformed is uh, within that center circle is that, you know, kind of that ultimate goal. And you see the kind of the two dark sides, right? The two dark blue circles, they're trying to help identify, um, you know, sort of one of some of those key resources that can be cultivated uh, to create the healthy economic uh, development of vulnerable black legacy communities. So by cultivating, identifying and cultivating those healthy leaders and also cultivating, um, you know, the, the kind of the healthy in infrastructures and combining them within the context of that um, uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems and you know, the resources and assets that can be brought forth by local governments and, and other community resources, you know, pulling all of those folks together and aligning them and, um, um, you know, kind of setting those program goals and the, the, um, the uh, outcomes that are needed is a great way to kind of pull people together. This is a great visual to help help others understand where you're moving to. And um, as you kind of look at the, the, the um, orange, right? The orange circle kind of focuses on some of those um, community assets that can really help bring some leadership around the process, right? And then the light blue circle is really some of those uh, key players um, especially as it relates to economic development and community development um, that, that will really help communities not only kind of recover, but, you know, ultimately, I think the goal is to have them flourish, right? And mm -hmm. so that the communities flourish and then that through engagement, you're creating um, flourishing individuals and families within those communities. Um, and engaging those communities and families in a way that makes them feel good and proud and 
um, and, and connected and supported. So, you know, through the work of Sandra and, and the cooperative extension system within she, where she works, she's been able to build those healthy leaders and engage those community members and uh, in, in a way that can move them forward. Um, and so, you know, as, um, as she kind of puts in those, I'll just call it the, uh, the, the, far, the four corners of the document or the visual here, she's kind of showing those ultimate um, outcomes, which are really about engaging um, partners, you know, creating change, um, integrating extension programming, and I'm sure that's just, it's not just the community development extension programming, but the other things that cooperative extension can bring to really create flourishing families and communities. So, um, and this model may look a little uh, similar to the previous health uh, and wellness model that the that ECOP put forth. Um, and so Bonnie and I kind of took that model and, and massaged it a little bit for the farm, um, you know, wanting to create healthy farms, right? And so Sandra did her magic and adapted it for uh, creating healthy communities. So um, I'll pass it back to Sandra uh, so that she can put her two cents on, on what she's hoping to convey in this model here. Excellent, excellent. And um, the, the, the beautiful piece of this is having this framework laid out, I could easily in this project or this initiative identify the actual players for this initiative. And so it says to me that other types of initiatives could also use this model. So for us in North Florida, the, the entities that have played those leverage entities that are here, um, Southern Regional Development Center is a part of the USDA, uh, Office of Public Partnership and Engagement. A lot of their material in terms of how you organize communities to do the work that they need to do to solve their problems. And then key players that we were able to um, interact with were EPA, FEMA, National Park Service, and Blueprint. Because if you remember in 2018, could everyone put in the chat what came through the panhandle in 2018? Devastated. So a lot of the Black legacy communities um, were impacted by that. And so FEMA, EPA uh, invested uh, dollars for a consultant that really helped um, the, the community leaders look at how they could rebuild and how, could, how they could build uh, a recreational tourism economy. And so North Star Legacy fit right into that. And so they adopted the initiative and have made it a key part of the cultural element in developing a regional economy for the panhandle. And then um, here, we haven't really interacted um, with commerce, juvenile justice, education, health and human services, but because in previous life and because of my work in community development, I know they have lots of resources that can be leveraged to address different elements. Also Blueprint. Blueprint looks at conservation and all of those things and where water um, should be addressed, where wildlife should be protected, all of those things. They've been instrumental in developing maps for us that show the North Star Legacy community in terms of conservation. Then the Federal and State Forest Service, and particularly State Forest, well, Federal Forest Service as it relates to the um, Negro Fort, Fort Gaston. And what we know is that there was a period of time in history when Fort Gaston 
was its own country. Spanish weren't in rule, the bridges weren't in rule, the Americans weren't in rule. They were a band of people there, Native Americans, African Americans that merged and they called them Maroons. And when the fort was uh, blown up by, I think it was Andrew Jackson during his tenure, those individuals migrated to Britain, to Canada, to um, the West Indies, Trinidad, all of the Swanee River in um, Florida, other places along the water in Florida. And so those communities also play a pivotal role in what is the Black legacy communities in Florida. And so we've been able to tie all of that. Uh, technical application, uh, technical, yeah, technical assistance application. We received that from the National Park Service, $20,000, which was significant um, for a little burgeoning um, initiative. And okay, so I'm not gonna spend <coughs> a long time on this piece, but it just shows um, some of the social ecological, um, um, uh, the risk factors or the stressors that are associated with these communities, lack of land or risk of land loss, lack of entrepreneurial skills, finance, uh, uh, financing and knowledge skills, that's for individuals. And the way that we look at it is risk management skills of investment of education, training and incubators. So that addresses the entrepreneurship. How do we help people realize their history digest it, be able to see what is in it that has economic mobility for them, and then to look at their land, hey, let's not sell our land, or if we sell our land, maybe not sell it, but maybe we lease it, and helping people to realize those opportunities, and it's ongoing investment, and then on, it's a personal, same thing as individual, um, then we look at history, the risk factors is suppression of knowledge, degrading of knowledge, death of oral history, historians, lack of youth engagement. So I can look at my own personal family, my grandmother, paternal grandmother who adopted me, she died at 100 years old. She died in 2010. Her best buddy who lived right over from her, from us, he died, I think two years ago, he was 104. So all of those individuals, as I said earlier, are gone. Um, they, at most, my grandmother had about a sixth grade education. You know, they still were in survival mode most of the time when they could have written things down or translated it in ways that they needed to. So it's important for us at this stage to engage our youth with the knowledge that we do have and let them transform it into ways that will engage their peers. And then some risk management is champions. I see myself as extension, but I'm also a, a champion for North Star Legacy communities. Uh, and so we need more of those um, uh, resilience factors, platforms that engage youth in translating oral history into music, engage champions. So that's just one. There are many other resilience factors that we can have. Then land, land loss and heirs property, my area of specialty. And it's what I did my dissertation on because my grandmother, when she passed, had heirs property that transferred over to me. And what you will find in many of those legacy communities that the ones I'm talking about, there is an abundant abundance of heirs property that is easily lost or stolen from forced partition sales. Um, there's insufficient number of competent legal professionals who can address the heirs property issue. And so some management is education, training, financial assistance, because many of the people cannot afford the cost that is required to, to clear land to heirs property. Um, local organizations, lack of stakeholder, stakeholders at the decisional level, um, risk management strategies, existing and new nonprofits committed to community revitalization, um, lack of stakeholders at the decision level for the federal and state 
local government, um, some risk management strategies that we've been able to utilize with the North Star is the Uniform Petitions Heirs Property Act. We held a town hall um, in 2019 out of that, uh, a committee formed out of that where um, they worked to get the Uniform Petitions Heirs Property Act passed in the state of Florida, which is major. And basically it helps um, heirs property owners have due process in maintaining the ownership of their land so that it is not stolen and that if it is stolen, they can acquire it at a reasonable price. And then as I mentioned earlier in a previous slide, previous, previous slide, technical assistance, the National Park Service, FEMA, EPA, OPPE, and the Southern Regional Development Center. So you can see how um, we've kind of pigeonholed uh, what needs to happen and what has already happened as it relates to risk management strategies. So I would say with North Star, we are right between truly understanding the risk, risk factors and developing some risk management strategies. We have not moved to resilience factors and resilience strategies yet, um, but that is part of the process. So, um, I'm not privy to time. Kelsey, can you hit share with me where I am? Because I would like to give people some opportunity to provide feedback. Yeah, we have about another 20 minutes. I think you did have a question here in the chat if you wanted to go ahead and answer it. Sure, um, sure. It's from Jeffrey Lewis. He said, historically, what were the underlying conditions that resulted in the demise of North Star communities? Are these still present? And how are they addressed to help sustain the work? Oh, Jeff, you and I are coordinated. It's right here. So in the US, like North Florida was the last stand in perpetuating the slave-based economy. And those communities, they actually still exist. I am a descendant. Um, they exist, but as I said in my opening, they are deteriorating at a fast pace because those who could remember their parents and grandparents from the 1800s basically have gone on. And so if we, those descendants don't have or didn't receive that knowledge that they have, then we have no way of understanding the value of our history and the value of our land. Back in the day, the elders, because the land was so important, would walk their children and grandchildren around the periphery of the land so that they could know. They would talk about the stories. They would talk about um, what people did and how they secured land. You know, stories from my grandfather was illiterate. He signed his um, uh, wedding certificate to my grandmother with an X, but he was a very entrepreneurial man in that he would develop coal out of trees and go into town and sell it there. He um, sold moonshine, though it was illegal at the time, but those are some things. He created social, social ventures like the tur uh, shooting match, which um, a name that's more familiar might be a turkey shoot. And ours continues today, but it's been going on since the 30s. And so this uh, picture, he, the pictures on this page represent um, a community to the north of us called Rock Hill. It's about three miles from us. And these are all sisters, um, a beautician, a teacher, a teacher. And this is the kind of history that permeates all the legacy communities. Not that they're all went into uh, professional type uh, jobs, but the history that they amass and that they bring to the table 
is wonderful. And so one of the goals is, as I mentioned in a previous slide, is to reach them while they're still alive and get that history translator, translated. I, this lady right here lived right next to us. She's still alive. She's a minister. I missed the bus going to Head Start. She gave me a ride to Head Start. So that was probably in 65, 64. She's a teacher that came out of my community, Barrel Hill. Her uncle was 104 year old. Her mother, Miss Marie, uh, was 94, 97. So all of these people are assets in the community that we have to catch, capture. So they are experiencing rapid loss, urban sprawl, out migration, restrictive zoning, family heirs property, um, perpetual under appropriation of funding and services, uh, a lost collective economic vibrancy in terms of the mom and pop stores. So when I talked about um, my grandmother, these are some pictures of my family. This is my great grandmother, great grandfather who were born in the 1800s and their youngest two children. My grandmother who lived to be a hundred was their third youngest. And something that I came up with that still resonates with me now, Collective and Organic Living Museum of African-American Cultural Heritage in North Florida. Birthed on plantations where the enslaved fueled Florida's plantation-based economy evolving into the Florida we see today. These are some of the descendants of those, my, great, my grandmother here. She was probably about 99, yeah. And these are her great, great, and some of the greats. Um, and so one of the critical things is that we all as champions have a responsibility to provide her legacy and that of her grandparents and great grandparents so that they continue on the traditions and then entrepreneurship. So as we talked about healthy, healthy ecosystems in that model um, that Maria so eloquently um, described is this is what our goal is. We really want these communities individually and collectively to be a destination tourism region that um, has recreation, has entertainment. Many of these legacy communities have existing Chitlin Circuit buildings that are no longer being used except for one that's in the Bradfordville community in Leon County. And so we wanna reestablish that Chitlin Circuit where uh, entertainers come through again and it becomes a, a vibrant, place where families can generate resources, where they employ people. Um, this young lady to the left on this particular scheme, um, screen does all of the things that you did. She hosted an event for the class of 78, Fabulous Six. We graduated from Lincoln High School, but you can't pick me out. And we had a get together and we had a little wine party. That's her business. So we want to really focus on how do we promote businesses of those that live in the legacy community. To the bottom left are the Hill brothers who really carry on the tradition of drum beating. Uh, we have a significant drum beat in the capital county out in the rural communities. It's a, a beat that comes or was influenced by the Union soldiers when they came down on May 20th, 1865 to notify the enslaved that they were free. And this family is one of the families that continues that tradition. We are in the process of looking at how do we um, say that beat and um, trademark it such that it can be used 
and other music videos. And then that can be used to flow back into training our young, how to beat the drum to that cadence, how it can be flow back into other areas that impact these legacy communities. This is in the Bear Hill community. These are wild turkeys, <coughs> excuse me, that still come in from um, land that still surround us, owned by, we call it plantation or hunting lands, and they still come over in the communities. And so communities, in, uh, Black legacy communities in Leon County, maybe six miles away, we will share on Facebook our pictures and say, oh, your cousins are over here. So just the fact that you can come in these communities and still see wild turkeys, you can still see deer, you can still see a lot of those things. This is my aunt's yard they're walking in. That's down in the front of my yard. So it's just great place now to talk about an entrepreneurial ecosystem, economic ecosystem in Jefferson County to the west of, uh, well, to the west of us, they have um, the Ocilla River where a slave canal was built, built, built. That's what they call it. And it was built by enslaved people. But if you will see, just copying this from Google, they now have a paddling guide. Um, they have paddling tours. They have all of these things that are associated with the labor of these individuals. And the one magazine, well, not magazine, but document, it has pictures of the enslaved, maybe on a wagon or something, a few of them. But the write-up is about the researchers. It in no way benefits the people who lay, labor. And so that's where this project comes into play. It is how to help people tell their own story and translate it into things that their families are able to generate wealth from, send their kids to college, pay their taxes, pay their health insurance, pay all the things that are rising, the costs are rising and are difficult. So this is an example of what I mean by um, the stressors. And when you see your history being used or co-opted and you don't, you don't know how to do it. And so that's the role that I feel that um, North Star Legacy Communities um, play. So then to recapture uh, the first slide that I showed or a second, it showed the, the, the pilot project from Jackson, Gadsden, Leon, Jefferson, and Madison, five contiguous counties. And there were two more that were considered um, the largest plantation counties. And that was Alachua and uh, Marion County. But you can see, these are the major plantations in Jackson County, but they were, there were smaller ones as well. Sometimes there were family owned, uh, families owned slaves as well as big landowners. Um, this is Gadsden County. Um, Gadsden is to the west of us. Then Leon is a center. We had the largest. There were between nine and 11 million enslaved people in 1860 and between two and three million white people in um, 1860. But to see the dichotomy of that data is to see, to not see the businesses, the innovation of people of color really represented in the county. And how do we change that? How do we integrate them into um, of, uh, or develop their own vibrant economy? And then this is Madison. Jefferson that I mentioned with the slave canal. And one of the reasons that they built the slave canal because the plantation wanted a way that goods from Louisiana 
could come in through the Gulf, but there wasn't a way to easily get those goods to the plantation. So they cut a canal so that they could do that, bring those goods into the plantation. So how did we practically, I think I'm out of time, right, Kelsey? Um, you have another five, 10 minutes or so. Okay, so how do we go about uh, getting, building? Uh, well, we focused primarily on one of the counties first, and that was Jackson County. We reached out to um, Florida State University. Oh my gosh, and I forgot to put Florida State on my map. I hope they're not on what I do. Hope you are. Anyway, Florida State was critical critical in their Department of Urban and Regional Planning. They have a lab where um, students who are getting their master's in urban plant, regional planning worked, wrote a Department of State small grant. And in that grant, it also had resources where they hired students. I mean, they hired residents of Jackson County to go out and do oral histories. And when they did the oral histories, they identified the cemeteries and the churches. When in any place, when you can identify the churches and the cemeteries, more than likely, 99%, there was a community, a Black community there, right? So then from that, the students identified the communities, and these are the Black legacy communities that are in Jackson County. And this is a work that Martha McGinnis, who does uh, cons consultation with Impact Collaborative, drew from the work that the students and the residents um, captured. And now, 2022. North Star Legacy is part of a prospectus for um, the North Florida counties impacted by Hurricane Michael and promoting it as a part of the regional economy such that potential investors would come in, work with families, work with entrepreneurs. This is cane grinding that they do in Jackson County annually. And there are so many elderly men like this who continue to um, make cane syrup and all of that to this day. And so all of that history, this was a civil rights um, area. This is one of the Chitlin Circuits building that still exists. So, um, our milestones, where we have gotten to. Here is FSU Durham, uh, Florida State University 2021, um, the mini grants, and they've now received another mini grant from Gat for Gatson County. So what we've done in Jackson, we will be doing in Gatson this year. So I really hope that um, presentation of this project inspired you with work that you're doing and also if you're interested in working with us further um, as we truly build out this as a model we welcome you any questions or comments i think we have one more question from jeffrey in here um, he asked how might we address systematic and structural racism that continues to oppress and limit the growth and resiliency of Black communities? Well, one of the ways that we're doing that is um, from the whole initiative is about that. It's about leveraging assets, organizations, people, individuals, such that the, the communities that are being impacted have the resources to self-direct their health through a healthy economic 
ecosystem, entrepreneurial ecosystem. So when they have the capacity, when they have the knowledge, when they have the resources, when all of that is brought to bear, then barriers may still be there, but now they're savvy enough and they have champions that can help them navigate those barriers. Um, so Maria, if that question were asked of you regarding farm, farm family, how would you address that in context to the model? I, you know, I think one of the things um, that we learned in some of the work that we have done around the farm uh, resilience piece is uh, working at multiple levels at the same time. And by that, I mean, you know, what are the programming, what's the programming that can be done with individuals um, or families to help them understand the resources that they have, you know, maybe change their perspectives a little bit, give them the confidence that they can move forward. Um, and then also kind of working at the community level, um, you know, with other organizations to help them um, understand the issues um, from the clientele's perspectives. Um, I think that that's really important is sort of to translate what people might know academically um, to something that's really real. And, and then being, um, being the, the helpful voice, as, as Sandra said, the champion that can connect the two so that they can learn from each other. I think that's so important. Um, especially around issues around racism um, or, or any of the isms, you know, people who are aware, um, um, I don't want to say this, they come from their own perspective. And so I have found that in creating opportunities for communication and sharing, all of a sudden people's perspectives get broader and, and you know, once you hear the real story, more compassionate. And so I think that that also builds the, the personal linkages that um, en encourages engagement in different ways. And I have to really applaud Sandra because she has been working so hard to be that champion, to, to translate the language and the culture and the, 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 the context for people at the, at the at the community level but also within the the government levels I'll, I'll just say the organizational institutional levels um she's done an awesome job of that and and you know in a sense um has really transformed these communities through her uh through her efforts so um i hope that is, adds a little something to the conversation if, if I can add, just to follow up, because there was a later comment, I actually felt like, and I, I like what you had to say there, Maria, but what you, when you began talking about the sort of um, sharing of that sort of that local history, to me, that's, that's, that's where, you, that's where so much of what we need exists. In other words, um, there are tremendous barriers that, that people had to overcome, as we well know, and there are rich stories and histories around how we've been able to do that, that this is not new. And I think to the extent that we are tapping those stories um, for that kind of knowledge and insight as well, both internally for the community to strengthen itself, that knowledge of that history of the success of that resilience, um, even in the face of brutal oppression is incredibly um, important. Also to your point, Maria, is, you know, sharing stories, um, both historical and current uh, with others makes a, a difference as well. Um, so anyway, I, I feel like that, again, I think I agree, Maria, this work is, is exemplary. I think in so many ways, it's much is so needed. And I, I love that emphasis on drawing and tapping into that rich history of people's lives as a way to deal with real structural and systemic um, problems that we, we face today. 
you know, I one of the experiences that I had just in doing the farm stress piece is, you know, farmers, you know, don't think of them. I mean, they're stressed, but they that's their normal life, right? <laughs> so they don't think it's unusual. And yet when I turned around and talked with our director of human services in our state and I said, this is what's going on with farmers. And she says, I had no idea they were such a vulnerable population mm -hmm. because that was not her, that was not her training to, uh, to think of, um, how do I wanna say this? She tends to think of vulnerable populations by demographic statistics, right? Like, are they, you know, living in poverty? Are they, do they have access to food? Do they, right? She didn't think of farmers as a, as a group, as something, as some, as a group that could be vulnerable. And so it just opened her eyes and it opened my eyes to, my gosh, this is language that people in the health community use. And so that's kind of why I said what I said is sometimes it's just creating the understanding across whatever the groups are so that you're all talking about it with some of the same language that really connects you. Yes. So um, I extend an invitation to all of you who would like to engage in this work and add in any way. Because I think the, the, one of the people who has been the greatest champion has been Louise Vaughn from Blueprint Southeast, who saw this work. She was working with the consultant group that FEMA EPA brought in. And um, when I started uh, meeting with the group as they were uh, doing community engagement about what was needed, and I shared what I was. And from that point on, she's been strategically um, helpful in pushing and driving and creating conservation language and tying it in and building bridges. And we just submitted, um, we, FSU decided was the, the lead fiscal agent for America the Beautiful Project. Um, that's coming out through the uh, Biden Foundation about um, preserving um, historic and recreational places and da 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 da. Um, North Star has a key role um, in that particular um, application. So um, I think you're right about when we share a cost different um, disciplines, um, agencies, people learn more about what's going on and bring skill sets that are needed, um, that are absent. So thank you, Marie and Bonnie. Give Bonnie my thanks too. <laughs> thank you, Jeffrey, for those questions. They were great. Great. Thank you so much, Sandra. That really was great to hear about. I mean, not even just the history, but how you guys use it to help build, you know, the resiliency and the sustainable economy. Very interesting. So um, we went ahead, we put in a one minute feedback survey. Please go ahead and fill that out for us. It really is just four quick questions. It takes about one minute um, and it helps us better understand how we can improve our next program center stage. Um, and from there, we'll go ahead and let everyone jump to their next meeting for the day. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day and thank you for attending. Bye now.